I'm Eddie Muller, TCM's very own film noir tout. You want to bet a sure thing? Then skip Red Lightning in the seventh and put all your money on the killing. Today's entry in the Noir Alley sweepstakes. The world's most respected movie handicappers all have this one either win, place, or show on the list of all-time great heist movies. But to say that it was a sure thing out of the gate would be very misleading. This was the third feature by a young New York photographer turned filmmaker, Stanley Kubrick. But the first time that he was gambling with Hollywood money, which always has strings attached. For an artist as fiercely independent as Kubrick, there were bound to be some hurdles. The director had begun his professional career as a photographer for Look magazine, and his work not only showed an instinctive eye for dramatic lighting and composition, but a sensibility forged in no small measure by movies he'd watched in Manhattan's movie palaces and art houses. His first two films, Fear and Desire and Killer's Kiss, were the work of a young man who'd seen more than his share of noir. Now, you veteran TCM viewers have at least seen bits and pieces of Killer's Kiss because TCM used the film's evocative location shots as a lead-in to the network's Movies After Dark series. Like many young independent filmmakers who'd follow in his footsteps for generations to come, Stanley Kubrick made Film Noir his Hollywood calling card. For his source material, Kubrick chose the novel Clean Break by prolific pulp fiction writer Lionel White. Now, White was the literary equivalent of a B-movie maker, cranking out thrilling, fast-paced novels for low-rent houses such as Gold Medal and Lion Books. And what separated White from his colleagues, and what I am sure attracted Kubrick to Clean Break, was his fascination with non-linear narratives. While his plots were often pedestrian, and he wasn't above swiping storylines for movies, White's narratives were unique for the way the action often backtracked and overlapped from different characters' perspectives. And Kubrick's decision to maintain this unusual device would result in his locking horns with executives at United Artists, the film's distributor, which had put up money for what it thought was a straightforward, low-budget heist picture. To add even another layer of hard-boiled authenticity, Kubrick hired another Pulp Fiction specialist to write the screenplay. Jim Thompson is now considered one of the masters of American noir, but at the time, he was just another bitter, alcoholic wordsmith living on paltry advances for paperback originals like Savage Night, The Grifters, and The Killer Inside Me. Kudos to Kubrick for recognizing Thompson's affinity for desperate characters and the great gallows humor in his dialogue. The writer, unfortunately, had a nasty falling out with the director after Kubrick took a screenwriting credit and reduced Thompson's contribution to merely dialogue by. Well, they either buried the hatchet or Thompson was really hard up for money because he'd work with Kubrick again two years later writing the screen adaptation of Humphrey Cobb's novel, Paths of Glory, which would truly be Kubrick's breakout film. Now, the casting of The Killing is ample proof that Stanley Kubrick loved film noir. The crew he assembled for this caper is a veritable who's who of the genre. Sterling Hayden was fast approaching his last bankable day as a leading man, but here, Kubrick gives him a second chance at the big score that eluded him in the asphalt jungle. The character of Johnny Clay is a smarter and craftier big city cousin of the hayseed hooligan Hayden played in John Huston's classic. But will he be any luckier? Now, give or take a few thousand, I figure the loot on this deal at two million. Colleen Gray who was introduced in film noir classics Kiss of Death and Nightmare Alley, rates second billing as Hayden's almost angelic girlfriend. She was always the lone ray of light in noir's dismal demi -monde. But Colleen herself admitted she was not the female lead in this movie. That would be Marie Windsor, Kubrick's first and only choice for the pivotal role of low-rent femme fatale Sherry Peaty. 
The only thing that could have made Marie's performance any better is if she got to play opposite another genre icon. And wouldn't you know it, as her Weasley, weak-willed husband, Kubrick cast the avatar of weak-willed weasels everywhere, Elijah Cook Jr. And their scenes together, slinging Thompson's brutal barbs, are domestic life at its most dire, a marriage made in film noir hell. Why did you ever marry me anyway? Oh, George, when a man has to ask his wife that, well, he just hadn't met her, that's all. Well, I talk about it. Maybe it's all to the good in the long run. After all, if people didn't have headaches, what would happen to the aspirin industry? Kubrick stacks his deck with a hand-picked rogues gallery, all familiar from dozens of noirs. Jay Adler, Tito Vuolo, Joe Turkle, Joe Sawyer, J.C. Flippin, and a pair of wild cards in the mix that give bizarre and unforgettable performances. Cola Quariani as Maurice Obakoff. You may need subtitles, even though he's speaking English. And Timothy Carey as sharpshooter Nicky Arano. Well, I'll have more to say about those gentlemen on the back end of the show. When Kubrick turned in his final cut, United Artist was outraged and demanded he restructure the film so it wouldn't confuse audiences. And after a bit of back and forth, Kubrick held his ground, keeping the structure as it was in Lionel White's novel. And rather than spend any more money to re-edit the film, United Artists dumped it on the bottom half of Double Bills with a Robert Mitchum Western, Bandito, directed by Richard Fleischer, himself only five years away from having made his bones with a bundle of terrific B-crime movies. This film represents the precise crossroads between first-generation film noir and the coming of a fresh tide of filmmakers influenced by classic Hollywood but operating outside its studio constraints. Things started to change in 1956, the year Stanley Kubrick pulled off The Killing.